Engineers and DevOps track. Our next speaker is Michael Bright. Um, he is a developer evangelist at Containus. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today about serverless computing. So without further ado, Michael. Thank you. OK, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk to you about serverless computing. As you know, ah, I can't change slides. OK, uh, Okay. so about myself, briefly, I'm, I'm British. I live in Grenoble in the French Alps. And I recently joined a company called Containus, um, who are developers of Traffic. It's a fairly well-known, widely deployed uh, reverse proxy load balancer, which you'll see a bit later. I'm also a Docker community lead, and I run a Python user group in Grenoble. And I'm crazy about open source and cloud technologies, serverless unikernels orchestration, all that stuff. And I don't know why my slides aren't advancing. Okay. Uh, so just a word about traffic, which you'll see a bit later. So I say it's uh, a reverse proxy load balancer. Uh, it has an advantage in that it was designed for the beginning f for doing uh, hot reloads of its configuration. Uh, so it interfaces with various backends, so things like uh, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, and so on. It can pull out the, informa the information about the services running these systems, and it automatically configures itself to front-end those systems. Uh, it has uh, Let's Encrypt support with automated renewal of certificates, which is a pretty nice feature. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very widely deployed, and it can act as a Kubernetes ingress controller, something I demonstrated uh, in Kubernetes tutorial on Friday. OK, so anyway, we're here to talk about serverless computing. So what I want to do is give an overview of the space of serverless. So that means, well, what is serverless? I guess you generally have an idea about that. Um, a re review of the different cloud provider offerings. I mean, very brief, say that they exist. Um, it's, it's important to see. Um, the fact that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is also working on this. They have a working group to tie and encourage standards in the space. Uh, very briefly, the open source tools. And then a look at various open source platforms which exist, uh, which would allow you to do on-premise deployment of serverless, for example. Say so on-premise, for example, or on a, on a YAS uh, cloud provider. And then I'll do a demonstration of OpenFast, one of the main platforms uh, integrated with traffic. OK, so what is serverless? Well, first of all, does it mean no more servers? Well, of course not. Um, uh, our, our software still has to run on some uh, somewhere. It's going to be physical machines. Uh, but it's, it's about taking away the responsibility of uh, maintenance of servers uh, for the developer. The developer now is just involved in writing the, the business logic, the main functional code. I see it as the ultimate cloud native if you see that we've moved from bare metal to virtual machines, containers, getting lighter and lighter, and the developer has less and less uh, responsibility for the overall infrastructure, and serverless is the next step on that, on that journey. Serverless also is not just about the functions. It's actually uh, functions as a service and backend as a service. So functions as a service is really the developer just you know, providing his functions, his business logic. Uh, in practice, running in the cloud in particular, uh, it makes sense to use a lot of uh, uh, backend servers, services via their APIs. There may be APIs running in the same service provider or elsewhere. Um, and so serverless is about writing glue code as well to uh, glue those pieces together. This does mean that uh, there's a risk of having lock-in, but actually no one's forcing you down that route. If you want to develop for AWS Lambda, which is the, one of the leaders in this space, um, quite likely you will choose to use some of their back-end services like DynamoDB or uh, the messaging system, but you, you could use other services or, or not, and so on. You, you've chosen that lock-in. 
Okay, otherwise, a lot of people don't like the term serverless. I do. Uh, it's a paradigm, which is both function as a service and backend as a service. Uh, but it's also a company and a tool that I don't like. But okay. Okay, just another look, a look at it from another angle. Uh, so, as I say, it's you know developer focusing on his apps, and then it's the platform provider who is responsible for uh, provisioning the platforms, auto scaling them if needed. Uh, generally maintaining when there are problems like meltdown and spectre um, it's the platform provider who will be responsible for upgrading the systems and you might not even see any downtime given the, the way that uh, these things will be load balanced transparently it's very much a pay-as-you-go platform uh, in principle at least uh, with uh, several of the cloud platforms you typically get uh, one million requests a month free, uh, which of course is a huge number if you're just developing. Uh, once you're deploying, then you, you'll start paying, but it's still not too expensive. Though I say in theory, in practice, uh, you will be wanting to use backend services, and one of those is something called the API Gateway, which can have costs. Uh, there's no initial investment. Uh, you can just open an account on AWS starting using Lambda. If you're not using the backend functions, then you can just use your, your free tier. So it means there's no uh, capital expenditure. You're not buying any servers um, and no operating expenditure either for the actual uh, server installation. Uh, you get high availability for free. Uh, if the cloud provider is doing his job of just uh, doing the scaling out uh, as, as needed and you can you can deploy the same functions across regions in the cloud and so in that way you will get high availability free and you won't be paying more uh, as long as you're not using the back-end services uh, it allows short time to market enables innovation I mean you can uh, create a new service extremely quickly if all you have to worry about is just uh, the functions of your code and this can scale massively so the overall architecture is like this you'll have a developer who's going to develop his code and load it up into the platform that be a cloud provider or not the functions uh, nothing's running until events start arriving. So events is a completely event-driven architecture. Events could be coming from some of your back-end services, um, maybe a trigger in your, your database, files being uploaded. So with Amazon, for example, a user might upload an image file to S3, and you might have a trigger configured uh, to do some processing on that, that, that image and maybe st store it back in S3. Or you might have, have messages coming in from um, different sources, including SMS, why not, an external provider. And then, of course, uh, web requests coming in over an API gateway. Uh, so these could, should be a, could be just standard browser requests, or maybe JIT webhooks, or Docker Hub, or whatever. Um, so your functions are responding to things uh, happening externally. If we look at the use cases for serverless, uh, so it, obviously event-driven, and that could be um, regular events um, that uh, represent a real peak, uh, like a, a monthly payroll or processing um, I don't know, end of day accounting or something. Uh, the important thing is where serverless becomes interesting is where these are real peaks of load. So you're, you're getting a better uh, utilization rate of, because there is hardware somewhere, you, you want to be have, having efficient usage of that hardware. So if you're using serverless for just peaks, uh, then you're, you're getting uh, to be effective. If you've got a fairly constant load, well, you should maybe be looking at other technologies like platform as a service or just straight uh, containers. Uh, it's something that's applicable to quite a few domains. Um, whether it be DevOps, CI/CD, 
uh, banking, IoT. Um, what's important is that we have certain uh, characteristics. So as I mentioned, some sort of peak um, processing. Uh, your application has to be latency tolerant. Uh, I think we're typically looking at like 100 milliseconds uh, response time. And those, uh, those treatments should be relatively short-lived. Uh, in Amazon Lambda, for example, I think they cull services after about, uh, or functions after about five minutes. Okay, let's look very briefly at some different cloud providers. Um, there are more, but we can see these are the fairly uh, standard uh, cloud providers. AWS Lambda, uh, I've got another slide on them, so I'm talking more detail, but they were the first in this space. Uh, since then, the last two years or so, we've seen Microsoft with Azure Functions, Google Cloud, and IBM Cloud. Uh, Azure. Uh, it's a pretty nice platform. They've got a nice user interface. Of course, they understand developer tools. And uh, I think we can expect interesting things from Azure Functions. Uh, Google Cloud, uh, I don't find very clear where Google are going with serverless. Um, I'm not convinced that they're convinced. Um, IBM Cloud Functions is quite interesting. They started an open source project called OpenWhisk, which they then donated to the Apache Software Foundation. And so their IBM Cloud Functions use now uh, Apache OpenWhisk, which is something that you too can use. You can deploy that uh, yourself on premises. So if you look at uh, AWS Lambda, just an example. Uh, there's a certain number, oh, they launched it in beta at the end of 2014. Uh, it wasn't until about end of 2015 that it was stable. Um, but there's been a huge developer uptake on that. And th they did this because they, they realized that more and more um, functionality that developers were using on top of Amazon EC2 was tending to be a lot more glue code of the back-end services that they have. So suddenly, um, having this sort of low-cost function as service model uh, isn't so low-cost after all. It's actually very interesting for them as a, uh, a gateway through to the, the higher-paying uh, back-end services. They provide a number of language choices. Um, typically, these, uh, these platforms are based on container technology that we don't necessarily know how, how Lambda is in implemented exactly. Um, some platforms tend to allow you to bring any container to them, or others are more li limited in language choices, maybe because of the need to uh, have bindings to uh, back-end APIs as well. And recently there were some new features announced, which is uh, Go uh, as, an, as a new language, though this is Go as a static binary. Um, so this, this is very effective, it's quite performant, but on the other hand, uh, you don't have the same integration with, uh, with the IDE currently. And they also uh, provide some uh, tool for offline debugging, which is something that was missing before. Okay. And there are potentially huge cost savings for serverless. There are some real examples where um, s services have been implemented alike. 5% of the cost, and there have been other examples where the promises look good, but at the end of the day, something like the API gateway, which is built differently on some platforms, was uh, quite costly. So in this slide, uh, sorry, it's a bit small, but um, the bottom line in that table is showing that uh, the API gateway is uh, free on uh, IBM Cloud and Azure Functions, but it's paying on Lambda and Google Cloud. So I mean, just to say there are uh, characteristics you need to be aware of um, that could bring in uh, unexpected costs. I mentioned that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has created a working group, so they're creating a lot of materials around this space, and they're trying to get to the point where there's common terminology and hopefully common definitions of maybe events or this sort of thing. Uh, tooling, so very briefly, um, 
actually there are hundreds of open source tools and if you search on GitHub for awesome serverless you, you'll find uh, a very impressive list and there are some particular tools that are worthy of note uh, so serverless uh, which is uh, the company serverless.com provide a tool that um, that interfaces with various um, cloud provider platforms. So it gives you a tool where you have a framework, you can easily deploy code to the different platforms using the same deployment commands. Okay, Maybe the code won't be exactly the same because you will have to adapt. All these uh, systems are quite homogeneous, but you, at least at the deployment level, you, you can have the same processes uh, to deploy, roll out across these different platforms. Um, there are others, um, Apex in particular, there's also uh, Chalice from AWS themselves, which is open source, uh, which is specifically Python for uh, Lambda. But if we look at the open source platforms, so you know, Lambda is proprietary, as is Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions. Uh, IBM is the only one using um, an extended version of an open source platform. But there are these open source platforms that you can deploy on-premises or on a YAS platform yourself. Uh, so let me see, uh, Kubeless and Fission are a couple that, are, that run on uh, Kubernetes specifically. Um, it's Apache OpenWIS, so originally from IBM. Uh, one uh, detail about OpenWISC is it's uh, bring your own container model, uh, as is OpenFast, uh, which is quite nice. That allows a lot of innovation, as we'll see. There's the FN project from, uh, from Oracle, and, and Nucleo, which is particularly suited to uh, high-speed uh, data stream processing. So they're focusing on the, the latency issue. But I'll look at just one of those and I'll demonstrate OpenFast. Uh, so OpenFast comes from the Docker community. Uh, it's a bring your own container and that's really nice. It means there's been a lot of innovation using this tool. Uh, it, now it has a, a portal and now with a function store integrated into that portal, which is quite nice. A command line tool as most of these platforms has. Uh, it also has a flavor that will run on Kubernetes. Um, and it's quite easy to get started. There are a lot of guides available. Uh, one example was uh, uh, a colorizing project from uh, Finian Anderson. So uh, he did a blog post on colorizing video with OpenFast. Uh, it wasn't a, a real-time thing. It's actually frame-by-frame frame conversion of, of images. And I actually have a demo of that um, actual colorization of images. Okay, so time to have a quick demo. Let me just introduce very briefly. So I'm going to combine OpenFast with traffic. Um, basically, traffic allows you to front-end uh, your set of services. So an environment where you have a lot of microservices running uh, within some orchestrator under Docker Swarm, Mesos, or Kubernetes. Um, traffic allows you to do several things to route uh, domain names or uh, paths or even ports or some combination, basically URLs, um, through to backend services. Uh, it allows you to control how those appear uh, when you connect to them from the internet so you're not exposing your internal infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned earlier it can also do um, Let's Encrypt uh, uh, certificate um, uh, renewal. And uh, it's a load balancer, of course. So for this demo, I've integrated it with OpenFast. Uh, with OpenFast, uh, we'll actually have a set of functions. Uh, in this case, I've configured um, just my local host to, to correspond to each of these functions. And traffic, then based on the host name to which we're querying, uh, can feed through to the appropriate function running in our serverless platform. And this is running on Docker Swarm. So um, I'll go to the command line to, to show this. In fact, 
basically just how I integ integrate traffic itself into the Docker Compose, and then how I integrate uh, one of the functions with the traffic-specific characteristics. Just, uh, okay. Okay, this is where it gets tricky with the mic. So this is the Docker Compose for OpenFast into which I've integrated uh, traffic itself. Oh. <laughs> I see a to-do there. I'd remove that earlier. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we're configuring uh, to access the, the dashboard of traffic itself uh, to connect to the Docker socket. To in, we connect to the Docker socket to be able to um, interrogate Docker Swarm and discover the services already running in our, in our platform. Um, we're going to have a, a web interface. Uh, we're using the functions network. Basically, uh, OpenFast itself creates a network apart for all the functions. And I'll, I'll show the dashboard of traffic now. Okay, so traffic provides basically two tabs at the top here, providers, and so we have Docker as a provider, and traffic has automatically discovered uh, the services running in our platform. Um, so in fact, we have a front end for each of the services, for each of the functions we have. Uh, we can see here there's thing Base64, Colorize, Echoit, all of these functions, and then we have uh, a pointer to the back end, which is actually service we're going to route to. We also have a, a health tab where we can see uh, the actual request statistics that have been going on. Okay, so this is the portal of OpenFast. Uh, so some just very simple functions um, included to start with. If I just do a hello world, if I can type my left hand. Then we have a simple word count. Um, then zero lines, I didn't do a carriage return, two words, 11 characters. And OpenFast uh, has a deploy new function uh, where we can uh, manually um, define a function or we can take it from the store. And one of those is this uh, colorization application. I'm, going, I'm not going to install that one. I've actually, uh, oops already installed it here. I'll just show you now accessing platform from the command line. Oh dear, getting out of VI. Just left-handed. Okay. So let me just show an example of one of the functions is Markdown. Uh, I've, I've scripted it just because um, I want to send just multi-line input into the curl command I'm going to use. It's easier that way. So I'm... Ah. Okay, just sending some simple markdown via a curl command to my server, and we can see that it generated some HTML. Okay, so just look at the curl command itself. The minus u user demo is some basic authorization, authentication that traffic has performed. Uh, we could configure that to go out to some back-end authentication server, but here it's just basic authentication. We're doing a post request against the functions. Remember on the initial slide, um, I showed that traffic is translating from some domain name. It's actually mapped onto local hosts, it might set hosts, but traffic will detect that host name and then forward that to the back-end markdown function. And then the minus D is just passing in the post data, uh, the markdown that we saw there. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna do a, a display of an image, okay, a black and white image, which I'm pulling just from a, a local web server on my machine.
And I'm going to do a curl uh, again with the user login, posting this to colorize.fn.fas, sending that same URL of an image. So that's now going to be processed by the OpenFAS. I've redirected the standard out to a file face. Okay. Okay. And so we now have a colorized version of that image. And so um, I didn't say much about that application, but that was uh, basically a a container someone has created which is actually using machine learning inside it. So I think it's quite powerful. We can see several things put together here, how we can easily have a machine learning function available just like that. Um, we can also route through to services in our infrastructure um, through the use of traffic. If I come back to my presentation. Okay, so serverless is still a young technology. We, can, uh, we see it evolving rapidly. Uh, there's a lot of uptake with Lambda, but there are other platforms uh, are very interesting, including open source platforms. I think we'll see a lot of evolution in capabilities, um, performance, and pricing models. Uh, there's a lot of promise for many workloads. There are constraints on you know, uh, latency requirements, this sort of thing. There are real cost savings, uh, providing these are sort of services, some sort of unpredictable pre peak traffic. Uh, all the major cloud providers are investing in this technology. There are many deployment choices, and as well, we need an open cloud. Today, there's not a lot of homogeneity uh, across the platforms for the moment. So thank you, if you have any questions. Um, be pleased to take them. Um, so we don't have any time for questions right now, um, but I'm sure Michael will be around and willing to field anyone's yeah. questions. Um, if the next speaker, um, Hector Martinez, is here, um, please come up. Um, and we'll be starting as soon as he shows up. Thanks.